this episode of Ice Pilots NWT. We got smoke on edge. A mid-air emergency. Just a little like a basket in case any fire. Forces the crew down. The newest McBrien gets her Buffalo initiation. Oh, yeah, I touched it. And Scott gets a lucky break. It's a weird dream right now. It may be springtime. With temperatures between 10 and 20 degrees Celsius, but that doesn't make running a northern airline any easier. A thousand kilometers west, a trough of low pressure is unleashing harsh weather on Canada's Yukon Territory. A severe storm is sweeping in from the coast, and that's a problem for Buffalo Airways captain Justin Simley. Uh, thunderstorms are coming up on the, the, the METAR. His flight plan leads straight into the storm. Well, we have a very important charter to Whitehorse coming up. Uh, Justin just informed me that there's thunderstorms between here and Whitehorse. Uh, so he's saying that we might have some delays. Uh, you know, it's very important for these passengers to get theirs for a conference. Uh, we can't be late. 13 civil servants headed to the Northern Bioenergy Conference in Whitehorse are already starting to board. Uh, the passengers have meetings, they have delegations, they have conferences. Once you commit to, to leave with them, your commitment is, is to make sure they arrive on time. Hey, Andrew. I think we're going we're gonna to delay it. But the weather around their destination forces a sudden change of plans. Hold on. Everyone can go and sit back down for a bit. <laughs> we got to look at some uh, some weather there. Hey, John. Co-pilot Andrew Fike uh, breaks the news. It just kind of went down in Whitehorse, so we might have to delay it for a bit. The flight isn't going anywhere until Justin likes what he sees on the weather maps. Yeah, so she's saying there's two big cells, one north and west of the airport. So this cell's like right in our track from Watson. Okay. It's a, it's a big cell. Tops are like 30,000 feet, but they're two isolated cells at this point. A storm cell is an air mass formed by powerful updrafts and downdrafts. They can unleash thunder, lightning, heavy winds, rain, or hail. Not a good idea to be flying through the hills uh, with some thunderstorms rocking and rolling. So see what happens. But Joe's pilots must always play it safe. Yeah, if I don't look good, hold for another 12, go five and one. Yeah. Won't go in there if you can't get out of it. The weather may be fine in Yellowknife, but the crew and passengers will have to wait for it to improve 1,100 kilometers away around Whitehorse. Whitehorse is so nice. you never been there. Eh? Like, downtown is, like, a real downtown. Nice. Yeah, like, freaking man, everything there. Even a Starbucks. If this charter gets off the ground, the Buffalo crew will wait in Cosmopolitan Whitehorse during the conference, a chance for some R&R. You're always going full tilt around here, 24-7, basically. So it'll be nice just to wake up, you know, tomorrow morning and just go for breakfast, relax, you know, maybe do a bit of fishing. That thing's bigger than my nephew. <laughs> Definitely want to go fishing. I'm pumped just to be out of yell night for a couple days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A few hours later, Andrew checks on the Yukon weather. We had clouds at about 4,800 feet in the last hour, now they're at 6,000 feet. Uh, the winds have calmed down. The That's captain the makes his decision. I think we're okay. Sounds good, man. Okay. Weather looks to be good, so we're just going to throw a little bit more fuel in the plane, and uh, we'll be out of here in about 10 or 15 minutes. Okay? I think we're good to go here, so we're on our way. The white horse again. After a shaky start, 
Justin can only hope the weather in Whitehorse continues to improve when they fly over the Mackenzie Mountains. Buffalo 224, line up for runway 15, traffic for all runways are on. Line up only runway 15, Buffalo 224. It's a five-hour flight to Whitehorse, 1,100 kilometers over some of the most rugged wilderness in Canada. So far, there's no sign of any bad weather up ahead. For Andrew, this is a rare chance to fly over new terrain. It's pretty nice, man. It's not flat like everything else I've done so far. There's actually, well, it's it's all good, man. It's a change of scenery. It's kind of nice. As clouds loom in the west, Justin checks on the weather in Whitehorse. Buffalo 224, Whitehorse radio. And uh, Whitehorse, it's Buffalo 224. We're just looking for the latest out of Whitehorse. Uh, still some thunderstorms in the air. Affirmative. Uh, there's still some uh, isolated storms. Uh, 6,000 scattered with cumulonimbus with thunderstorms and uh, lightning clouds at ground. Okay, uh, Buffalo 224, we check. Thanks very much. Not what Justin was hoping for. The storms aren't clearing out as quickly as expected. Then, 400 kilometers from Whitehorse. What's that? We got smoke out of the engine here. The oil pressure in the right engine is suddenly dropping. It could be a major oil leak. She's spitting a little like a bastard out there. They could be minutes from engine failure. Uh, unless it's on the other side of the cowling. There's nothing on my side here. From the rear of the plane, John has a good look. Yeah, it's starting to smoke a little bit more there now, Justin. Do you see any fire, John? It's basically white smoke. Roger. Maybe, maybe a bit of oil or something, right? The number two engine could be failing. Okay, Andrew, I gotta go have a look at this thing. I want you to just hold 95 or 100 knots as best you can there. Okay, we're watching temperatures. Number two engine pressures. Yeah, you do what you need to do, man. Justin heads to the back of the plane to take a look. The vibrations are shaking loose the bolts that hold the engine cover or cowling. Coming Andrew's a rookie in a situation he's never encountered before. Go in there, Justin. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Okay. They're far from home, over mountains, and heading into thunderstorms. Now they have serious engine trouble, and there's no landing strip in sight. Buffalo's DC-3 charter to Whitehorse is in trouble. There's dangerous weather up ahead, and the number two engine is smoking and could fail. Immediately, the gears start going in the brain. Uh, if we have to shut down that engine, are we going to be able to sustain level, sustain level flight? Uh, where's our closest airport? Can we get in there? Do we carry on to the destination, or do we have to land at that alternate? Captain Justin Simley has a decision to make. Yeah, I'm just thinking. The DC-3 is an hour and a half from Whitehorse, but just 15 minutes from an airstrip at Watson Lake. Being 40 miles out of Watson Lake and being in mountainous terrain uh, with uh, thunderstorms around, uh, I felt it was necessary to land at uh, Watson Lake. All right, dude, let's, uh, let's start her down. I'm just going to give her a little power here and see if she'll take that throttle again. Justin doesn't want to alarm the passengers, so he ponders how to have John explain the diversion. Yeah, tell him, just let him know that the, there's some thunderstorms around Whitehorse still, and uh, we're just going to divert to Watson uh, briefly. We'll uh, take him into the terminal, and 
and I'll make the necessary calls to the company. Okay? Okay. With number two throttled back but still smoking, Justin has only minutes to get onto approach to the Watson Lake airstrip. 37 to 33. That's straight in front of us, sir. One more time, have a look. Thanks, good job. Good job, guys. 224, can I get your type of aircraft, please? Uh, 224 is a DC-3. The Watson Lake Airport was built as a way station during World War II for U.S. planes being transported up to Russia. And the stormy area has a tragic history of weather-related airplane disasters. In 1942, a B-26 Marauder crash-landed on the lake. A few years later, an Avro Lincoln did the same. Safely on dry land, Justin has to plot his next move while he and the crew examine the faulty engine. Would she piss on it? Leaking oil has left its trace on the cowling. Normally, these planes are so reliable, Buffalo doesn't send a mechanic on DC-3 flights. So, far from home, without tools, parts, or repairman, Justin can only call back to Buffalo HQ and ask for help. I'm still sh shaking and smoking pretty good. It's, I think it's jug, but I haven't taken the cowl off yet. So. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's, there's oil leaking out of it for sure. With a possible cracked cylinder, Justin faces the fact that this normally reliable DC-3 isn't going anywhere tonight. Get some maintenance out here and uh, yeah. add some spare parts, and we'll get these guys a hotel, and uh, we'll go tomorrow when the airplane's fixed. You gotta be the bearer of bad news, right? Flight attendant John Martin breaks the news to the passengers. It's showtime. Who have to be in Whitehorse by morning for a conference. All right, so uh, Justin made the call. He said, we're gonna stay here tonight. I'll go up and talk to the guy upstairs and um, get him to call cabs for you guys and see what the where the hotels are in town and stuff. But on the bright side, we're only an hour and a half from Whitehorse. Back in Yellowknife, Joe's already scrambling to come up with a solution. Keep an eye on that softy weather, Alex. He calls in a favor from a buddy who owns an airline in Whitehorse. We got on the phone and hired, uh, got uh, Joe Sparling and. Uh, Air North, and within an hour, he had a hawker in the air coming from Whitehorse down to Watts Lake. This is the airline business, Northern style. When one company has a problem late at night, another rushes a crew together and comes to the rescue. The backup plane, Air North's Hawker Sidley, arrives in Watson Lake. The hawker is essentially the European DC-3. And in fact, it was designed to replace the DC-3. So actually, in this scenario, it kind of did. Buffalo Joe's connections in the north have paid off. His passengers will soon be on their way to Whitehorse in another company's plane. Gave us a breathing room to sit back and see how we're going to uh, fix our airplane. At the same time, we were able to get our passengers into Whitehorse in, in a timely fashion. This isn't about money. It's about saving face and about future business with the government. So Joe is determined to have his plane fly the passengers home after their conference in Whitehorse. Morning, sirs. Morning. Shorts. Shorts, yeah, and matching jackets. First thing in the morning, Joe arrives on the sked and springs into action. Uh, can you get me a rod for a minute? We'll have a little meeting here. Yeah. What we want to do is uh, get uh, Cliff, and I'm going to send a helper with him. Joe is sending mechanic Cliff Dyson 
a 14-year veteran with Buffalo, to Watson Lake. Because of the blown cylinder, we didn't want to take any risks because we're flying over mountainous terrain, so we sent our best uh, mechanic. And I don't want to jeopardize the the airplane until we've had a good test. Oh, yeah. It could do a half-hour flight around Watson Lake. On a and then we know whether or not we should be ferrying home, replacing the airplane, or continue with it. So I would um, take as much stuff, flash up and go. There's your pilot. Captain A.J. DeCoast will fly him there. So they're going to go replace the cylinder and hopefully get it serviceable by tonight to make uh, Whitehorse. The Buffalo Rescue Squad sets out, with Cliff bringing along his son Travis as his assistant. They've got just one day to storm in and get the plane fit to fly to Whitehorse or kiss any more charters for this customer goodbye. Foot seven, Scott Blue is a big guy with a big voice. <laughs> There's one box underneath. <laughs> Media! Media! <laughs> Scott and another Buffalo pilot, Gord Cooling, are loading the DC-4 for a run tomorrow. Scott is a C-46 co-pilot. He rarely gets to fly the big four engine DC-4. But if he wants to add it to his repertoire, he needs stick time before he can take the DC-4 pilot test. Can you come with me just to get that blast yeah. thing? Thanks. Though tomorrow, he'll be on board just to help with the cargo. Still. Going for a flight beats the hell out of hanging around the barn anytime. Over in the Yukon, Buffalo's stranded DC-3 crew has a few hours to spare until the mechanics arrive from Yellowknife. The pilots are in Watson Lake, population 1,500 the gateway to the Yukon, and kilometer 980 of the Alaska Highway. With a short cab ride, they visit Watson Lake's most famous tourist attraction, the Signpost Forest. Cool. Home to over 75,000 signs. We should have brought a buffalo sign to hang up here. In 1942, a homesick American working on the Alaska Highway put up a sign showing the distance to his hometown. Others followed, and a tradition was born. Some call it the largest collection of stolen property in the world. Imagine the tax dollars that are spent just for this place to replace signs. <laughs> There's a little bit of home, man. <laughs> Someone stole a Crescent Beach Cloverdale sign. <laughs> Their cultural excursion over, it's time for the crew to return to the airport to meet the repair team. Buffalo's rescue plane touches down, with pilot A.J. DeCoast and mechanics Cliff and Travis Dyson on board. Hello, folks. What you guys do now? Over the years, Cliff has earned his chops as a mobile mechanic, fixing Buffalo Airways vintage planes throughout the north. Oh, I'm just going to see how bad it is as we call it, assess the situation. If Cliff can repair this DC-3, he'll also help repair Buffalo's reputation. <laughs> but it did let right go, eh? And it, you could see it, when it let go, it hit knocked the cowling up like there was like that much of a space yeah. between the cowling on the top right-hand side. Okay. Before removing the jug, Travis strains the engine oil through a cloth for telltale signs of metal shards. Sure enough, Aluminum was sheared off when the piston scraped the cylinder wall. Luckily, there's no sign of further damage. The crew removes the engine cowling to get to the suspect cylinder. Now, Buffalo's maintenance crew can get down to work. In Yellowknife, there's a different maintenance job underway at Rod and Sasha McBrien's house. And you want to hold her body just between your elbow and your body here, like this. Oops. Oopsie. Emma Ray is now 12 days old, and midwife Heather Redshaw is teaching Rod the fine art of bathing a baby. Yeah. We'll just do her face first without any soap or anything, just so that she doesn't get anything in her eyes. For a guy who's spent a lot more time changing spark plugs than diapers, Rod is adapting to his new role as dad. She's not waking up, probably. Well, she's, she's hey, baby. 
Sasha gives her husband full marks. Rod wasn't scared of this. He wasn't nervous. And I felt she was so small and so slippery in the water. And he, he wasn't afraid at all. He did great. What's daddy doing? He's doing all this stuff that pisses me off. The moment she was born, I realized all that I thought was important before was not really important. Now, with a baby, you realize nothing else really matters. Yeah, get those little creases good, Dad. The minute that, that Emma Ray arrived, I don't know. It was just like something changed in Rod. He needs to be with her during the day, and that's as important as whatever's happening at work. There we go. There you go. Well, good job, Dad. Woo. On the tarmac in Watson Lake, mechanic Cliff Dyson has removed the cause of the DC-3 engine problem, a broken cylinder, also known as a jug. You've got the piston inside, and that's what's moving up and down. And when she blew, this thing should be one piece. That's what happened. And sure enough, we got oil pissing out, and that's what we saw over the side. And that created smoke. And from there, we knew it was bad news. In the engine, friction and heat from the pounding pistons make the cylinder walls expand. Then they cool after shutdown. It's rare, but in the Arctic extremes, this can weaken a cylinder wall over time until it eventually cracks. After years of fixing planes flown in harsh northern winters, Cliff has seen a lot of jugs blown out. This is fatigue, sweet time, eh? You know, and then shock cooling, you know, like cold, hot, cold, hot. It's not the first one I've seen, and it won't be the last one either. Installing the new cylinder is painstaking work. But the pressure's on to get this bird in the air and restore Buffalo's can-do reputation. At last, the new cylinder is snugged into place. Tomorrow morning, we'll do a test flight to determine if the plane can fly to Whitehorse and bring the passengers home. It's morning in Watson Lake in the Yukon, and the Buffalo crew is ready to go. But is their newly fixed DC-3? The job's all done. We go for a test flight for a half an hour, make sure everything's good, come back, pull the screen, make sure the screen is clean, and after that, we'll head to Whitehorse. Cliff will stay with the DC-3 while AJ and Travis head back to Yellowknife. So uh, get John and give Mike a call, please. Yeah. All right, thanks. With its new cylinder in place, the DC-3 is ready for a test flight. Justin does a run-up on the tarmac. The crew watches the temperature and oil pressure gauges carefully to make sure the new jug is working properly. It's all good, but the true test is getting her up in the air. We're just up for a test flight. Mechanic Cliff Dyson's work is on the line. If his repairs don't pass the test, Buffalo's reputation could be badly bruised. The charter passengers are expecting the DC-3 to fly them home from Whitehorse. And Buffalo boss Joe McBrien doesn't want to have to call on a competitor to bail him out again. She's shaking out there, she's leaking. How's she doing? No shaking, no leaking. Cliff checks out engine number two for himself. So far, everything looks okay. Coming up on uh, 10 miles on the map. Let's bring her out. Come back in. Justin gives rookie Andrew a chance to land. Pretty good. Yeah, that's all right, actually. With Cliff's seal of approval, yeah, not bad at all. engine number two is ready to go. Are we 
got the plane all fixed up uh, and uh, we're on our way to Wade Horse. In Yellowknife, Buffalo is preparing a DC-4 to fly a load of construction materials to the Arctic town of Kukluktuk, formerly known as Copper Mine. <laughs> In the spring, Arctic weather can be dangerously unpredictable. Where's a copper mine right here? So there's nothing now. Co-pilots Dan Catoni and Scott Blue check the latest forecast. Earlier this morning, an ice storm over Kugluktuk delayed the DC-4's departure. We are okay. Yeah, it looks good to me. Now things seem to be improving. Hey, Arnie. Yeah. Hey, uh, the icing's all gone in that area, so we'll load her up. We can do it today. Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader will be at the throttle. It's a fair amount of shit, actually, once you start putting it into the plane. Yeah. And Scott Blue, who mostly flies the C-46, hopes Arnie will offer him a Good stint in the DC-4's co-pilot seat. Yeah, I'm going to go with you guys, too. Very cool. That's on. Sounds good, man. But this isn't good oh, yeah, for Scott. AJ's already a captain on the DC-3 and C-46. He just needs a few more flying hours in the DC-4 to become a captain on this plane as well. I already extended the offer for me to go along with them and kind of get re-familiarized with the DC-4 a little bit. They might need another captain on it, so I'll uh, get on it any chance I can. So Scott's prospects for climbing into the cockpit just took a plunge. If there's one thing that uh, you learn at Buffalo, it's that you don't count your chickens before they hatch. It's a 600-kilometer trip to the Nunavut village of Kukluktuk by the Arctic Ocean. As the plane heads due north, Scott studies the DC-4 manual. Even if he doesn't get a shot in the cockpit, he's trying to learn as much as he can, brushing up on everything from hydraulic reservoirs to anti-icing equipment. Then, a stroke of luck. Arnie invites Scott, not AJ, up to the cockpit. He squeezes his six foot seven frame into the co-pilot seat. Hello there, Mr. Sir. Hello. Good For you, when you get flying this thing, you can adjust those rudder pedals down forward. Eh? Oh, for sure. See a little tab for you tall guys. Need them at the fucking floor. Us lanky bastards in. Drive away, Jose. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It's a very cool experience flying the DC-4 because you look out and you got two radial engines spinning there. It's not something you find very often these days. Planes with four radial piston engines are rare birds indeed. And the DC-4 was one of the first big planes to feature tricycle landing gear, a small nose wheel, and two big wheel sets under the wings. If you look at the setup of this plane, tricycle landing gear, you know, wing engine, Big two slides like this. This is, you know, one of the very first basic design of a modern airliner. And you know, from here they went to turbo props and they went to jets on the wings. But same basic layout. I mean, this is flying history. But Scott's moment of glory gets interrupted. An hour outside of Yellowknife, they hit some rough weather. And Arnie needs Dan back in the right seat. Okay, we'll take her down to 2700. Arnie dips below the ice clouds, where he should be able to see the gravel strip at Kugluktuk. It's coming up from 20 miles, and we're there and get towards the runway, I should say. But the late spring melt has exposed gravel patches everywhere, making it hard to spot the gravel strip. Hard to find the runway actually. Yeah, right the right it's hard to see it, Kukluktuk lies on the coast of the Arctic Ocean, at the mouth of the Copper Mine River. So Arnie tries to find the shoreline. You can see uh, it's almost like a ship on the shoreline. Oh, man. Okay. See the beacon? That yeah. tower there. Yeah, hey, we'll go gear down. Oh, 
Carlisle. 105 over 87. 100. It's spring in Yellowknife, but here in May on the shore of the frigid Arctic Ocean, it still feels like winter. With the ice storm still threatening, the sooner they can unload and head home, the better. Let's get the hell out of here. Plane's good to go. Let's go to Whitehorse. In Watson Lake, the DC-3 crew is finally set to head to Whitehorse. Oh, yeah. It's a good town, Watson Lake. Not allowed to say anything other than that on TV. A successful test flight earlier today confirmed that the right engine with its new cylinder is running smoothly. That's right. You're good, Buffalo 226, check you off at 2343 and have a good flight. During the 90-minute flight to Whitehorse, rookie co-pilot Andrew gets some flying time over the highest peaks he's encountered yet. And flying over mountains keeps a pilot on his toes. You're gonna get a lot of uh, turbulence coming off the mountains. So you're gonna have to take that into consideration. Because you get the wind and it goes on one side of the mountain, creates these, they're called rotors, or the other side, if you get caught in them, you can be Pushed down pretty, pretty hard. Atmospheric rotors form when powerful winds sweep over a mountain ridge, creating troughs of intense turbulence along the lee side. These killer winds have been the cause of several deadly aviation disasters. And Whitehorse, it's uh, Buffalo 226. Nearing Whitehorse, Andrew still has to wrestle the gusty crosswinds. After the random blasts of wind, Andrew continually adjusts the ailerons on the wing to roll the plane into the wind as needed. At the same time, he works the pedals to move the rudder on the tail to keep the DC-3 flying straight. In modern airplanes, aileron and rudder coordination is interconnected, but on the DC-3, it's all up to the pilot's hands and feet. Looks like a bit of a gust coming over the escarpment. I'll be ready for now here after this. You come over this thing. I go up, I go down. On approach, Andrew fights one last battle with the wind. Oh, yeah, well done. The final check's complete. You're good to land, sir. Okay, I got her. Well done. Uh, Finally, they're in Whitehorse, 48 hours later than expected. Whitehorse, the capital of the Yukon, was founded in 1898 during the Klondike Gold Rush. Today, it's a city of 25,000 people and has a surprisingly vibrant art scene. It's also one of the best places to see the northern lights between late summer and early spring. Back on the tarmac, Andrew and John have a few hours before taking the charter passengers home to Yellowknife. Well, what do you want to do for the rest of the day? Just go drive around, man. Enjoy some of the scenery. Yeah. Take some pictures. First stop on the sightseeing tour is a DC-3 mounted on a pedestal at the airport. They haven't cleaned the friggin' dirt off the tires. <laughs> it's one of the largest weather vanes in the world. That's awesome. The historic plane was built for wartime in 1942 and flew in India and China for the US Air Transport Command. After the war, the plane was outfitted for passengers by Canadian Pacific Airlines, and later worked for two small Yukon Airlines before she retired in the late 60s. But not before this plane taught Joe his baby steps. 
Well, I went on the airplane in 1969, and that was the airplane I took my initial course on. I, I was trained as a DC-3 pilot on that aircraft. Everybody in Neocon had flown on that airplane. Of course, it's, it's very fitting, and that is the gate guardian to their city. 1,200 kilometers northeast in Kugluktuk, Buffalo's DC-4 crew has delivered the building supplies and prepares for takeoff. Kugluktuk Airport Radio, Buffalo 5718. For the return trip to Yellowknife, Arnie gives up the captain's seat to AJ DeCoast. So I'm on the tailor till 60 knots, all right? Yeah. yeah. It's been nearly four years since AJ flew the DC-4. I'm all set, 394, sounds good. Okay, power is set. I give her a good pull and all yeah. that goes. Already a captain on the DC-3 and C-46, AJ is expanding the range of planes he can fly in Buffalo's fleet. It seems like they got a need for, for DC-4 captains right now, so... Uh, I'm all for it. I think it'll be great. It's for an amazing airplane. It's uh, got some uh, long legs on it. You can do some really long flights with it. And speaking of long legs, Scott is invited up to the cockpit again. For the second time today, he's getting much wanted stick time on the DC-4. He can hardly believe his good fortune. Is this a weird dream right now? All right, well, whenever you're comfortable, Scott, you can take control of her. Oh, you okay, do? We're going to stay on the main tank, so the duration of the leg. Check. It's possible. Okay, so you have control. I have control. It's possibility number four ox tank may have a little bit of fuel in it. All right. While AJ is on the verge of becoming a captain on the DC-4, Scott is nowhere close to a checkout on this four-engine beast. There's still a lot for him to learn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, fuel dump valve. Fuel dump valve right here. See that? Yeah, that's the fuel dump valve. Does it operate on there? It does. It does? For Arnie, this is a rare chance to try out the passenger seating. I'm, uh, I'm having fun. Today was a fun day. You coolness of this machine. It's just awesome. No other way to put it. Pretty damn neat. You know, you got good days and bad days in Buffalo, but a day like today when you get to play with something like this, uh, it puts a smile on your face. For Scott, learning to fly a plane this big is a thrill. And even for AJ, piloting this vintage DC-4 never gets old. In Yellowknife, Rod is back at home. He spends most lunch and coffee breaks with his new daughter, Emma Ray. But today is special. She's going to visit Buffalo Airways. Baby Ray's gonna have her first day at work and see what it's all about. So, we gotta go get set up. I don't know if we should be wearing pink, but we'll give it a try. Okay, baby. You ready to wear more crap? Oh, there we are. Well, there's the baby. Okay, do this quick. Dad, quit pissing around. Do this quick. Stick your hand through. Ugh, stretch. <sighs> Had to dress Mikey one or two times, and he's a baby. So, I don't know. I just stick a bag on him. But this is a little different. Carry him around in an old Labatt's blue box. Better. Time to go to the hangar. Hey. Oh, she looks great to meet everybody. I love it. Love it. Rod is needed back at the shop, so Sasha is driving Emma Ray to the hangar. There's such a great side of Rod coming out with this baby. Just a really soft, caring side that he doesn't seem to be too worried about showing, which is really nice, because I've always seen it in him, but, you know, I guess he's always been a little bit leery to, to really let it out. For Emma Ray's momentous first visit to Buffalo Airways, She's in good hands with Uncle Mikey. Oh, hey, honey. I find babies pretty funny. I think babies are upset, and they got nothing to be upset about. You know, they sit there and they're all cuddled all day and everything. I got like, oh, my life's so hard, I'm crying. Hi. Oh, yeah, oh. you're good. You're good, honey. Let's go see some airplanes. Oh, of sure. course. That should be good for her ears. 
<laughs> Mikey has a true McBrien sense of how to please a two-week-old baby. We're gonna see a C46, Emma. Look, Emma, right? It's a C46. Shh. There you go. Huh? Oh, there you go. He touched it. Back in Whitehorse, Buffalo's DC-3 taxis into position to pick up its passengers, who were still buzzing about their urgent landing in Watson Lake a few days earlier. Well, it was uh, quite an adventure. We had a VIP stop at Watson Lake and had a couple of beers. <laughs> it's great, other than watching smoke every once in a while. <laughs> but for a 75-year-old plane, I guess it's all right. Joe's strategy of getting his customers to their destination at any cost seems to have paid off. Are you familiar with emergency exit? And now they're flying home the way they came, on board one of Buffalo's classic DC-3s. Homeward bound, it's smooth sailing for the DC-3, at last. Although I didn't get to go fishing, I learned a hell of a lot from this trip. And I know that I'll take that with me uh, onto the next charter I, I go on. And uh, it's only going to be a progressive learning experience from here on out. As Justin slides into final approach to the Yellowknife Airport, the charter passengers are delivered home safe and sound. We don't, at Buffalo, we don't get too much of a chance, you know, to haul passengers around. So whenever we get a government charter with government people, it's good to, to show the flag. Sometimes when you plan something, uh, the universe has a way of throwing a curveball at you. But everyone jumped in and, and helped out and got the job done. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT. My son, Mike. Joe and Mikey go shopping for a plane in England. It's a thin line between want and need. <laughs> but things get out of hand. <laughs> Scott's in trouble in the C-46. And gets stranded on an island. Is that fixable, Jimmy? 